Thomas Merton was cool. Thomas Merton was also beat, hip, and noir. These categories hardly exhaust Thomas Merton at most Catholic of figures. Of all his guises, for example, we should remember, as Lawrence Cunningham reminds us, that Merton was first of all a priest and a monk. Merton, though, was also an artist, and not an artist who existed in some abstract universe, but an artist who inhabited the strange world of the post-war existentialist transatlantic avant-garde. This paper will explore Merton's citizenship in that world by considering him under some of the categories peculiar to that world, noir, hip, beat, and cool. This paper will argue that these categories, as historically limited and gendered as they are, are essential if we're to locate Merton and his work. It will conclude with a brief suggestion that while the post-war avant-garde helps us locate Merton, Merton's yearning for transcendence pervaded the seemingly secular post-war avant-garde. In 1944, three years after Merton joined Gethsemane, Paramount Pictures released Double Indemnity, that early classic noir film directed by Billy Wilder. In the film, Walter Neff, played by uh, Fred McMurray, a mild-mannered insurance salesman, plunges into a world of passion and violence thanks to the homicidal machinations of Phyllis Dietrichson, played by Barbara Stanwyck. Double Indemnity was quickly joined by a host of other similar films dubbed by French critics as noir. Offspring of the 1930s gangster films, noir films were bitter critiques of modernism symbolized by the modern city. The noir modern city was a midnight place, its jagged buildings reflected in puddles on asphalt, its denizens like Walter Neff leading lives of quiet desperation only a few vertiginous steps away from crime and perdition. Thomas Merton's often ferocious critique of the city is noir. Gethsemane, he wrote, soon after entering the monastery, is the only real city in America. The rest of America, he implied, is unreal. His criticism becomes more nuanced over time, but it does not disappear in the Seven Story Mountain. It is nearly Calvinist, but even after his Walnut Street epiphany in 1958, Merton, himself a modernist, remained as critical of modernism symbolized by the city as he'd ever been. Sister Therese Lenfort remarks that for Merton, the city is a symbol of modern society and the emptiness of technological man who, when conforming himself to its dictates, tends to lose all spiritual orientation. Noir, though, is not simply a synonym for pessimism or spleen. Noir is first an honest effort to confront the catastrophes of its time, Auschwitz and Hiroshima, but also the incessant assault on the person by advertising, consumer culture, and propaganda. But noir is also an imagination key to redemption. Double indemnity begins with a confession, flashes back to recount the protagonist's fall, and concludes by returning to his confession. Redemption is not guaranteed in double indemnity, but confession and repentance is at least a beginning. One might argue that Christianity, and in fact most religions, include a noir season in which believers are encouraged to face honestly the reality of sin even as they hope for salvation. Oh, Felix culpa, without noir, there is no redemption. Merton's noir creations found themselves in odd venues. His prose poem play, The Tower of Babel, with its Augustinian juxtaposition of the human and divine cities, first published in 1955 and included in the 1957 poetry collection, The Strange Islands, was dramatized on the Catholic Hour on January 27, 1957, complete with soloists and a musical score. Merton's bleak 1961 commentary on Auschwitz, chant to be used in processions around a site with furnaces, published by the beat poet Lawrence Ferlinghetti, was also set to music. Meanwhile, Lawrence Cunningham reports noir comedian Lenny Bruce, having most likely found the poem in the Ferlinghetti volume, included it in his routine. Meanwhile, in 1965, Paul Simon and Art Garfunkel recorded a simple dusatory philippic, or How I Was Robert McNamara Into Submission, a parody of Bob Dylan's Subterranean Homesick Blues, in which they sing, I Learned the Truth from Lenny Bruce, who perhaps had learned something from Thomas Merton. Hipsters, Norman Mailer wrote in his 1957 essay, The White Negro Superficial Reflections on the Hipster, Know What's Up. They know what's up, one might argue, because they've encountered noir. To be hip means to understand the psychic havoc wrought by Auschwitz and Hiroshima. In America, Mailer thought the only alternatives were to be square or to be hip. 
and the most hip people were African Americans. He focuses in that patriarchal age on young African American men. What makes them hip? They're hip because they know that America is not a safe home for them, that in white America they are unwelcome, that not only are they unwelcome, but that at any moment they might be the target of ferocious violence. But what makes the hipster hip is not only this bleak understanding, but his response to it. With his wide brimmed fedora, zoot suit, enormously long keychain, and swaying strut down the busy street, the hipster responds to evil with flamboyant defiance and an unshakable irony. The black hipster understands that while white culture dominates, it is both oppressive and often worthless. Or as Merton writes in 1948 in the Seven Story Mountain referring to Harlem, no, there is not a Negro in the whole place who can fail to know in the marrow of his own bones that the white man's culture is not worth the jetsam in the Harlem River. By white man's culture, Merton meant the conformity, consumerism, and American triumphalism that was already the target of his and many others' criticism. Merton, the modernist artist, would be a lifelong critic of modern society. By the post-war era, artistic modernism and modern society had long since split. The more rationalist and materialist modern society became, the more modernist artists defended what Stephanie Redkop describes as a sacramental vision of reality. Merton, the Beats, and the post-war avant-garde counterculture advocated, Redkop continues, a fundamentally spiritual sense of reality and the need for an imaginative spiritual rebellion against the modern cult of hyper-rationalization. Thomas Burton was never the target of racism, and once in the monastery, he was never seen in a zoot suit. Burton, though, was hip to Hiroshima and Auschwitz. By the 1950s, he was a passionate opponent of nuclear weapons and an advocate for peace, and once he became aware of the work of James Baldwin and Martin Luther King, Burton was a fierce advocate for racial justice as well. Burton knew what's up. Contemplation, Burton wrote, is the highest expression of man's intellectual and spiritual life, it is that life itself, fully awake, fully active, fully aware that it is alive. One might argue that contemplation is above all a kind of awareness, not unlike the awareness experienced in Zen, not unlike the awareness experienced by the hipster. No, not all hipsters are contemplatives, and not all contemplatives are hipsters. But some contemplatives, like Thomas Burton, might also be hipsters. Burton shared with the hipster something else, too, irony a fundamentally ironic stance for the world. In his 1973 book, Images of Faith and Exploration of the Ironic Imagination, William Lynch argued that faith is tied to imagination and that imagination, by tying together what is and what might be, what bees and what seems, is inherently ironic. The ability to see the comic, even in the midst of the serious, the satiric in the middle of the solemn, is for Lynch a mark of faith. If Lynch is right, Merton's often ironic life was preeminently faithful. Merton lived in the belly of a paradox. He famously commented in The Sign of Jonas. As a young man, he was a cartoonist for Columbia University's comic jester magazine. Friends often commented on his sense of humor and his booming laugh. His writing regularly takes on an intensely ironic and even bitterly satiric quality, as, for example, in the chant to be used in processions or Atlas and the Fat Man and many other works, not to mention his journals. His sense of the tension between false lives, selves and authentic selves, inspired perhaps by his reading of Camus, Sartre, and the French existentialists, his ability to sniff out phonies and his contempt for squares, is all part of Merton's hipster irony. Merton was hip. He knew what was up. Hipsters, Mailer helpfully notes, might also be beat, though while all beats were hip, not all hipsters were beat. You could wear a zoot suit and be hip, but not know much about Jack Kerouac. But if you were Jack Kerouac, you were both hip and beat with or without a zoot suit. Merton had mixed feelings about the beats. He thought their frantic lives fueled by sex and drugs were dead ends. In this sense, he was no beat. At the same time, Merton respected their outsider stance, their experimental art, their religious pilgrimages. Kerouac once remarked that by beat, he'd always meant beatific. In 1968, Merton invited Kerouac and Lawrence Ferlinghetti to contribute to his journal, Monk's Pond. On his way to Asia in 1968, Merton spent time with Ferlinghetti, that poor beat. The beat movement, Merton wrote in a 1961 letter to William Carlos Williams, was certainly religious in his concerns. 
who are more concerned with ultimates than the beats? Why do you think that just because I'm a monk, I should be likely to shrink from the beats? I am a monk, therefore, by definition, as I understand it, the chief friend of the beats. What Merton shared most with the beats was Zen. The beats took religion and especially what they knew of Asian religions very seriously. Allen Ginsberg was an idiosyncratic Hindu. Philip Whalen and Gary Snyder were the Zen Buddhists. Snyder was the model for the protagonist in Jack Kerouac's 1958 novel, The Dharma Bombs. Kerouac would write a biography of the Buddha, Wake Up, and a sprawling commentary on Buddhism, Some of the Dharma. Just when Kerouac was turning Buddhist, at the end of his life, he'd return to his French-Canadian Catholic roots, Merton became seriously interested in Buddhist thought. Both Merton and the Beats were fundamentally influenced by D.T. Suzuki in the 1950s America's Zen expert. The Buddhism scholar Robert Thurman writes that Suzuki inspired a cool, inexorable inner revolution. He inspired Thurman continued an entire generation of bodhisattvas of cool, like one might suggest Thomas Merton. Meanwhile, Mailer also argued that while hipsters could be beat, they couldn't be cool because hip was too hot. But here he was wrong about Thomas Merton. Merton was hip and beat and cool. Cool, even in Merton's day, was simply a very vague synonym for good, but cool was much more, especially in Merton's day. Marshall McLuhan popularized the distinction between cool and hot, the distinction Merton applied to the difference between his hermit life and life in the monastic community. Life in community, because of its busyness, Merton thought was hot. Life in the hermitage was cool. Miles Davis' 1957 album, The Birth of the Cool, was much more than a response to bebop. It was the fanfare for a whole orientation toward life called cool. Cool had its origins among African-American jazz musicians. Cool was a kind of sprezzatura, a striking mix of passion and restraint. For African-Americans, cool was an essential survival mechanism. In the face of insult and threat, it was essential to remain calm and focused An uncontrolled expression of your genuine feelings could be catastrophic. And so a mask of tense calm rather than the hipster's flamboyance, was the only way to stay alive. Though some as cool as Dizzy Gillespie could combine cool with a beret, goatee, severely dark glasses, and an often outrageous hipster sense of humor. Cool shared an intense sense of irony with the hipsters, but cool irony was not flamboyant and outrageous. It was, well, cool. Cool meant care and precision in demeanor, business suits for men, not zoot suits. It meant being real in jazz. It meant skillfully navigating the ironies of life. Cool originated with African Americans, but others could be cool too. Rick in Casablanca, that proto-noir film was cool. Rick demonstrated that cool could lead to cynicism and nihilism, but cool could also lead to redemption. It was only by being cool in dangerous Casablanca by coolly deceiving the deceivers all around him that Rick was able to save Ilsa and Victor. Thomas Burton was not Rick, though one might argue that Gethsemane was a kind of way station in a wayward world not unlike Rick's Café Américain. That Merton's many pilgrim followers were not much different from Rick's refugees, and that Merton was to many a kind of savior figure like Rick, though such an argument might be just a bit whimsical. What is true, though, is that Merton's commitment to African-American struggle for justice, his love of jazz, his sense of irony, all made him cool. Merton's fondness for Albert Camus also reflects Merton's cool. Camus was cool. His Dr. Rieu in The Plague somehow retains his dignity, focus, and compassion, even in the midst of catastrophe. Rieu, Merton writes, is a detached, coolly objective witness who speaks in matter-of-fact tones, avoiding all drama and overstatement, and yet with an authentic personal involvement in the struggle to save lives. Camus' rebel in his book of the same name is cool. He or she is fully aware of the noir world, the world of the absurd, but rebels against it by affirming courage and compassion. By holding both the absurd and rebellion together in imagination and action, both Camus and Merton are hip, but even more, they're cool. To argue that Merton was noir, hip, beat, and cool is to argue that Merton, the artist, was not some abstract and timeless spirit, but was an historical person who shared an historical era with his contemporaries. And like them, he was uh, both limited and liberated by these categories. Noir, hip, beat, and cool 
or limiting categories in post-war America, they were typically male and obscured the role of women within the avant-garde. At the same time, they were also liberating in that they permitted a reimagining of America's intractable racial categories. It's helpful too, in conclusion, to see something of Merton in the post-war avant-garde. Louis Menon has published a splendid and near encyclopedic account of the post-war world entitled The Free World Art and Thought in the Cold War. Merton is not in the index. Nor are Karl Barth or Paul Tillich, both of whom made Times cover in the 1950s and early 1960s. Religion in general is not in the index. It would appear that Menon shares the widespread secularization thesis, which argues that by the mid 20th century, the transatlantic world was an in an inexorable process of secularization. Menon, it also appears, has missed what's been called the religious turn in postmodernism, which challenges modernist secularism. Concern with secularism is no error, whether that concern is reflected in the atheism of Jean-Paul Sartre or the Christianity of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. The secularism thesis is not wrong, but it is incomplete. It fails to understand that an intense concern with matters of faith was also part of post-war intellectual life, especially the life of the avant-garde. A rich account of post-war culture must account for both bare room ruined choirs and for the intense yearning for transcendence that still haunted those ruins. Understanding the post-war avant-garde must account for, to speak with Allen Ginsberg, angel-headed hipsters burning for the ancient heavenly concoction to the connection to the starry dynamo and the machinery of night who poverty and tatters and hollow eyed and high sat up smoking in the supernatural darkness of cold water flats floating across the tops of cities contemplating jazz who bared their brains to heaven under the L and saw Mohammedan angels staggering on tenement roofs illuminated and must account too for monks living among the Kentucky knobs like noir, hip, beat and cool Thomas Burton. Thank you very much.